All right, thank you everybody for attending tonight's presentation with the Ramsey County Historical Society, the Roseville Library for one of our History Revealed programs that we're doing in combination with our new exhibition on suffrage. Tonight, we have women's suffrage in Minnesota. Unfortunately, Michelle Whitty could not be with us tonight. She is out west and wasn't able to participate. But we have Kate Roberts, and I'm very pleased to have her here. She is the senior exhibit designer at the Minnesota Historical Society, and she'll be doing a wonderful job for Michelle. And Michelle apologizes, um, but with the weather and bad internet, she wasn't able to really sign on correctly. I'll let Kate introduce herself in a minute. Um, and I want to also say thank you yet again to our partner, the Roseville Library. We've been working with the Roseville Library on History Revealed programs for almost three years now, and we're very pleased to present tonight's program and many more programs to come. Um, we'll be doing more programs in conjunction with our exhibition, Persistence, Continuing the Struggle for Suffrage and Equality. 1860 to 2020. So please watch our website, www.rchs.com for information on programs. And you can also visit that website. There's a link to the online exhibition on the home page. So while you're there, please consider supporting the Ramsey County Historical Society. We rely on the support of members and friends like you to continue to present these programs and all of our other efforts. And there are some great benefits to joining. So check out our website for all of that information. And I'm going to turn it over to Kate Roberts right now and to stop sharing the screen so she can share her screen. And thank you, Kate. Thank you, Robin. And everybody cross your fingers, make sure that my screen shares now, okay? Send good vibes. Are we all systems go, Robin? We are. It looks great. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Well, as Robin said, I'm delighted to be here tonight in place of Michelle. My name is Kate Roberts, and I am from the Minnesota Historical Society. So let's move to our next slide, and I'll explain a little bit how Michelle and I are connected. Michelle and I, along with the League of Women Voters of Minnesota, have worked for two or three years now on an exhibit that was scheduled to open last month at the History Center, commemorating the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. As you all know, the History Center was closed until very recently. We couldn't get into the building to build the exhibit. I'm happy to say that we have a new opening date now in March of 2021. We'll be presenting a revised version of that exhibit. Um, so stay tuned on that. But in the meantime, we did go online with, with our resources and more about that at the end of this presentation. So the partnership with the League, of course, is a rich one, as any of you know, who are connected with or have um, participated in any programs with the League. They come with a great deal of knowledge, of enthusiasm, of passion for this work. And we were lucky to take on the topic of suffrage and voting rights with their able assistance. We have many collections from the League, which is what we could bring to this partnership. And this is a photo on the left of some League members managing a donation to the Historical Society. And on the right, there's that banner in storage in the sub-basement at the History Center. So it's been really a pleasure through all of this to see how, how the history just merges together and how the past hundred years of, of the League and the past hundred years at the Historical Society really intersect. So Michelle always starts with this slide. So I'm gonna do the same and I get to have the fun now. Unfortunately, we're not in the room together so we can't do this as a quiz, but just play along here on your own and let's just set a little background here. When did the first Women's Rights Convention happen in Seneca Falls, New York? 
the year is 1848. The 19th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution was passed in 1920. That's 72 years between Seneca Falls and 1920. Remember that. Takes, took generations for this to happen. When did Black men get the right to vote? That's 1870 with the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. Then Michelle follows this with when did Black people really get the right to vote? 1965, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is seen by many sociologists and historians as being the point at which the restrictions that were keeping many Black people from voting were finally legislatively eliminated. When did 18-year-olds get the right to vote? I remember this one, 1971. When did Native Americans become citizens and finally get the right to vote? That's not until 1924. So think about that. There were Native American women, and we'll talk about this more later, who were working for suffrage without any clear understanding of when they would actually be able to vote. And it didn't happen for them until four years after the 19th Amendment was passed. When did Minnesota elect the first female US Senator? Remember this one too, 2006 with Amy Klobuchar. And finally, when did the League of Women Voters of Minnesota incorporate? 1919, that's actually the year before the amendment passed. First the National League and then the state's leagues all set up in anticipation of the passage, which was starting to feel like a sure thing by the end of 1919. All right, so what my plan is for tonight is to just go through a history of suffrage in Minnesota, focusing on a few high points and focusing on five or six, the stories of five or six women, some fairly well known, others you maybe have not heard of. And I can't see you because I'm sharing my screen and I can't see if you have questions. So what I'm going to do periodically is just stop and ask if there are questions. I'd love this to feel more like a conversation than a lecture. Um, at this time of night. So um, I will pause now and then and see if anybody has anything to, to add. So let's get into the early years of the suffrage mo movement here in Minnesota. It began with women working alone in small groups and taking action as best as they could. Remember 1848 Seneca Falls, right? 1858 Minnesota becomes a state we aren't terribly well populated, of course. There aren't a lot of women here in the state. So that explains why people are working alone and not really able to bond together yet. Um, as you know, the movement started out east. Women out east got into the movement of suffrage along with abolitionists' movements along with the temperance movement, all of these social causes were allowing women to step a little bit more out of the domestic sphere and into the public eye. So certainly the people who were in Minnesota, settling in Minnesota at this point, many of them came from the East Coast. They saw what was happening there. They perhaps had experienced some suffrage rallies as small girls or as young women. And when they moved here, they took that passion with them. So suffragists began petitioning our legislature the first time uh, in 1857, actually before we were even a state. And that went on and on and on at every legislative session for decades. We came really close to success in 1870, which is fascinating to me. We could have been not the first state, but very close to the first state to pass women's suffrage. The bill passed both houses, Governor Austin vetoed it. So um, we wouldn't have been the first, that's Wyoming in 1869, but 1870 would have been very early. The women who were working so hard for this 
finally saw some success in 1876. And that's when we, our constitution was amended, women were allowed to vote for and to run in school elections. And that happened then, women were throughout the state, were running, were starting to take their place on school boards. Libraries, same thing, 1898. So the first woman I'd like to talk to you a little bit about is Sarah Berger Stearns. And here's a quote from her, reinforces what I was just telling you. Advocates of suffrage in Minnesota were so few in the early days and their homes were so remote from each other that there was little chance of cooperation. So she experienced this firsthand. She was born in Michigan. She became active very early. She went to her first suffrage rally when she was a 16 year old girl. And she also petitioned the University of Michigan to, um, to admit female students. By the time they actually did that, she had graduated from the state normal school. Nonetheless, she was an activist from a very early age. So she comes to Minnesota, settles in Rochester with her husband, and immediately takes up the cause of suffrage here in Minnesota. And she does exactly what I was describing to you. She gets out and she gathers signatures. And that's her main mission for many years. She and a, a handful of other women get out, deliver petitions or, as far as they can, get as many signatures as they can and go off to the state capitol. They make speeches very early and there are other women doing this too. The one that um, you're probably most familiar with is Jane Gray Swisshelm. She's also speaking at the Capitol. She's Harriet Bishop is. There are a number of these early Minnesota women who are doing this. So this is what happens. As Sarah Burns fi uh, Stearns finally moves to Duluth where she takes up the charge up there and, and starts a suffrage group up there. She's the first president of the Minnesota Woman Suffrage Association, and that's a huge deal when that finally happens. That's 1881, and that's the point that there really gets to be a change. Now we're organized. We're affiliated with the national organization, and she and 17 other women found this organization. She's the first president, and things take off. I'm going to pause there just to see if there are any questions. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat, even in between the pauses, and we'll read those out. So um, again, the chat you can find at the bottom of your screen. It'll just be a little button that says chat. I don't see any questions right now, Kate. So Sounds good. I'll keep going. So I mentioned that now we're in the late 19th century early 20th century, thousands of suffragists across the state by now. I should mention the Minnesota Woman Suffrage Association in 1881 had that first founding group of 18 women. By 1882, they had 200 members. So you can see how this is snowballing. People are ready for this movement. So women are working around the state in small groups, largely gathering in their living rooms, gathering in churches, bringing themselves together for this cause. One of the interesting things to me, and I'm sure you've heard this many times, many suffragists that we know well tend to have been middle class and upper middle class. Those are the women who wrote the history of suffrage. And those are the women with the time, the energy, the means to volunteer their work. So these are club women. These are joiners. These are people who get out and do things for the civic good. And what I find fascinating is that they come together and they drift apart. You can have suffragists and anti-suffragists opposed to each other, but then coming together in another club the next day. One of my favorite examples is the Women's Club of Minneapolis, which was founded right around this time by one of the major founders was an anti-suffragist. So there's this really interesting level of respect and of coming together for a cause while recognizing that maybe we don't agree on everything and we don't even always agree on how to pursue our goal, but it's a goal worth pursuing so we move forward. 
And I always like to say, don't think of the suffrage movement as women locking arms and moving together as one. Think of it as women moving forward on their own paths that sometimes intersect, sometimes come apart, but are always looking at the same goal. I wanna introduce you to Marie Botno Baldwin. She is someone who we discovered through this project, and I'm embarrassed to say I, I didn't know anything about her story before, before I started this work. She was born in Pembina, which is up on the North Dakota, Minnesota border. She's a, she was a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. And she ended up coming to the Twin Cities to work for her father, who was a lawyer, who um, it took largely cases related to Ojibwe people, treaty cases, land disputes, um, citizenship in the case of, of some people who had married or in other ways had these citizenship concerns. So Marie Batino Baldwin ends up working for her father, then moving to DC and becoming a lawyer herself and also working in the Office of Indian Affairs. And what she said in 1914, she was quoted as saying, the trouble in this Indian question, which I meet again and again, is that it is not the Indian who needs to be educated so constantly up to the white man. It's the white man who needs to be educated to the Indian. And this was her cause, to make sure that she kept her identity intact, that she didn't become assimilated into white society as she worked within the US government, but that she recognized that she had a role to play in educating others about Indians, about their rights, about laws of sovereignty, et cetera. I love this photo of her and here's why. That's how she chose to have her personnel file photo taken when she worked for the civil service in, in DC not in the garb that we see depicted here, but in her tribal with a, with a robe and with her hair in a more traditional um, style and with her earrings. And I find that fascinating that she was making this point all along, that this is my heritage and it's important that, that, I, that you understand and that I understand that I walk in both worlds. And she did walk in both worlds. It's, she participated with suffragists. She marched in the 1913 march in DC with other women. She, she became a lawyer in 1912. So she marched with a group of lawyers. And it's interesting because I think what we see is this solidarity with other women, see a solidarity with professional women, even though, as I say, it was uncertain when this amendment would apply to her, she still participated. I'm sure most of you know of Nellie Griswold Francis. And so, but she is another woman who plays a major role in the suffrage movement in, in Minnesota. And as you know, she's a force for all sorts of reasons in St. Paul. But what I find really interesting about Nellie Francis is something that, that um, Professor Bill Green talks about a lot. And if you haven't seen his book on Nellie Francis, it just came out. Or if you haven't heard him speak about her, please you know, do look for him. He's, he's fascinating on the topic. And what he says about Nellie Francis is that she realized that it was important to work for suffrage as a civil right. For her and for other African American women, jobs, places to live, education, there were a host of civil rights that were important to them and to their relatives across the United States. Voting was not necessarily uppermost in, in their minds, but it was part of the package. It was part of the package of civil rights. So she chose to jump in and fight for suffrage, and she chose to cross the color line and work with white women in Minnesota. Some of her friends ostracized her for that, 
they didn't feel that she should be doing that given the way African American women were treated in so many parts of the country, being asked to be at the end of the of a suffrage march, not being admitted to suffrage groups that were largely white. You know, things that that we know from you know from recent history um, or from recent historians who are uh, finding out more and more of these stories of how the movement was segregated. Nonetheless, Nellie Francis chose to work with Clara Uland, the head of the Minnesota Women's Suffrage Association at the, in the 19 teens and up to 1920. And as I say, she did that at some expense to her own reputation. I love this quote that she delivered. She delivered this commencement speech. So think of her as 17 or 18 years old. Let's just look at this quote together. Let those who are philanthropic and who desire the Negro's welfare aid in the solution of the problem, not by contributing to the unnecessary large sums, but by throwing open to capable and competent Negro men and women, their stores, offices, and places of business, permitting them to enter on the same footing as men and women of other races. 18 year old girl standing up in the auditorium, giving this speech, which is published in the appeal and the recorder, the two African-American newspapers. And she really never stopped. As you know, she kept fighting for the rights of her people and for all people. The year after suffrage was passed, Nellie Francis pretty much single-handedly pushed through this bill in the Minnesota legislature for the act to prevent lynching. This, of course, in 1920, what else happened? The horrible lynchings in Duluth. There were lynching bills going on in a number of states. Nellie worked with her peers in other states to get the language down. Then she finessed it here for Minnesota legislators. She spent a lot of time lobbying, and she got it passed in 1921. I love this. I came across this one day. This is a letter from W.E.B. Du Bois, um, one of the founders of the NAACP, a major figure in civil rights in the 20s. Congratulations on your success, he says. It was a fine piece of work, but for heaven's sakes, Nellie, now that you have got this done, rest. If you keep on at your present rate, you're going to have an awful breakdown. Please listen to reason. My love to yourself and sister your husband and your grandmother. She's a wonderful woman. I encourage you to learn more about her if you, if you don't already know quite a bit. Okay, let's keep going. So getting the word out, we're getting closer and closer to 1920. Suffrage movement is gaining momentum. We need some new tactics, right? A lot are working and most of them are word-based flyers newspapers, constant letters to the editor, speeches all over. I mentioned those petitions. Those petitions are coming. There's songbooks, there's cookbooks, you name it. But something else comes along at this time too. And it's been fomenting for a while. And this is this radical arm of the suffrage, national suffrage movement. And I'm sure if you've been paying attention to all the coverage that's been going on, you've seen mention of this, the silent protests staged at the White House by Alice Paul and the National Woman's Party in 1917 to 1919. This is a radical arm, but an important arm for the suffrage movement. And really the folks who are towing the line, working day by day, hour by hour, writing those letters, giving those speeches are complemented by the women who are putting their lives on the line and getting arrested and force fit. And most of the women, it appears, understand that both of these things have to happen for there to be success. Now, it's interesting because a lot of times people will say, not in Minnesota. There wasn't a radical arm in Minnesota. And I heard that very often when I was starting out this research. Turns out not so much. And one of my favorite people, and there are a number of Minnesota women who went to DC, who was a, were arrested multiple times, who uh, there's a woman named Sarah Tarleton Colvin, who's from St. Paul, who some of you may recognize that name for many reasons. Um, she actually 
she joined something called the Prison Special, which was a train that went across the United States with suffragists on the, the back, giving speeches, all wearing their prison garb and talking about their time in prison. And they went across the country. Okay, so that's Sarah Colvin, but let's talk for a minute about Bertha Moeller. She may be my all time favorite Minnesota suffragist. This is from a letter she wrote in 1917 back to headquarters. She's been on a major tour around the state. They keep sending her out because she's a very engaging speaker. She, um, she doesn't have children and that matters at this time. Single women, women without children, we are having these these talks and you see that coming through in the Minnesota Women's Suffrage Association records. In any event, she gets sent all over the, the state and she's a very effective speaker and recruiter for the cause. So in 1917, she writes back, I'm really tired, but it's the kind you feel after putting over something with you, you love. A year later, there's Bertha Moeller, second from left, holding a petition in front of the National Woman's Party headquarters. Bertha went rogue. In 1917, the Minnesota Woman's Suffrage Association, headed by Clara Euland, said, we appreciate what's happening with these radical women, but we cannot endorse it. Bertha quits. She quits the MWSA. She joins the National Woman's Party. She goes to Washington. She gets arrested reportedly more than any other Minnesota woman. And I find it fascinating that, that she kind of follows her heart and sort of epitomizes how the movement changes over time. She lives it. And then she goes on, incidentally. She, um, after 1920, she moved to Chicago, she graduated from law school, and she had quite a career as a civil rights lawyer, which I find really interesting too. I'll pause again. Any questions? Any comments? We have two questions, Kate. The first question is from Eileen. What were the primary reasons that some women were anti-suffrage? That's a great question, Eileen. And Largely, what it came down to very often was, look, leave the political world alone. We have our sphere. We can do a lot within the work we do, but we don't need to vote and we don't need to mess in politics. We have strength as women. We have a lot that we can do as through our civic initiatives and through the bonds that we have built with each other, we don't need to get involved in politics. It's really interesting to read the arguments and they're, they're compelling. These are not silly, um, uninformed women. These are bright, educated women who just feel very strongly that their place is not running for office or even voting. They can influence their husbands. They can let their husbands vote for them. And that's enough. As you might imagine, given what I've just said, um, anti-suffrage is tended toward the more privileged end of the female spectrum. The people who did have men who would speak for them, the people who were able to get out and work in clubs and work together. But that was one of the real key arguments. And it's, it's interesting now to think that there was a time when there were women who were anti-suffrage. But like I say, it's, their arguments are compelling and they are strong, effective women. So the other question is from Michelle who has a question and a comment. The first question is, and I believe this relates to um, some suffrage women uh, not including African-American women in the movement. Do you think that a lot of the reason the women's movement were just trying not to alienate the South when trying to get the vote or were they really just racist? And her comment is that she loves that they were called the silent sentinels when they demonstrated at the White House. I love that too. Um, yeah.
you know, define racism is really what it comes down to, to me. And I don't have a good answer for this, Michelle. I firmly believe that there was a lot of not wanting to alienate the South. I do believe that that's true. But I think there is also, and always will be, a sense that to, to advance our cause for some people means advancing it with like-minded people of a certain background who are like us. And I, I wish I had a better answer for that. I really do. Um, but I think it's both, honestly, Michelle. I, I think it's both. I hope that's helpful. We can come back to that later if you'd like. All right, let's keep going. It's August 26, 1920, and we, the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution has become law. Minnesota ratified the amendment. As you know, two thirds or three quarters of the states have to ratify amendment before it can become law. And so Minnesota was the 15th state to ratify September 8th, 1919. So almost a full year before the, before the national amendment was ratified. I love this quote from Clara Euland. And again, Clara Euland is the head of the Minnesota Women's Suffrage Association when the amendment is passed. And she said, today is the commencement rather than the end of our work, the commencement, the beginning of our work. And this was something that was really important for us to get across in our exhibit and continues to be something that we, we talk about quite a bit. And Michelle in particular was very keen on our getting this across to our visitors that the 19th amendment and the passage is a wonderful moment. It's a moment for celebration, but it is just that. It is a moment. And then the work gets going again. We continue fighting for voting rights for everyone, for Native women, for African American women, for African American people, for the disenfranchised across the board. And that's exactly what Clara Ulan saw that she and the Minnesota Woman Suffrage Association, which became the League of Women Voters. She and her pals quickly realized, okay, the beginning of our work now is to educate women, to reach out to immigrant women, to make sure that people understand, now you have this right, here's, how, here's what you can do with it. And just like today, where the League holds um, forums and has all sorts of information on its website about how to vote. This is exactly what Clara Euland was talking about. And I find that really interesting that she had that vision. More about that later, but let's first talk about Marguerite Newberg. Now, you probably heard about, maybe you haven't heard about her, but maybe you have. Marguerite Newberg was from South St. Paul. She was um, a very young woman on August 27th, 1920, when she got up at 6 a.m. and she went to City Hall and she voted in a special election that had already been scheduled. This was an election on a uh, water tower. So she and another a cadre of, of South St. Paul women got up early, went and voted. And our thought, Marguerite is thought to be the very first woman to vote after passage of the amendment right here in South St. Paul, which is pretty fun. So there she is. And I, I just, you know, you, you see this young woman and all the enthusiasm that comes with her. Oh, yes, I'm a good suffragist. I'm enthusiastic over the ratification. I'm going to study politics and be progressive. Just great. So she, um, she had her moment of fame. The, the kind of fun thing about Marguerite, too, is that the, the precinct was short one election judge. So she voted. And then she turned around and got sworn in as an election judge and spent the rest of the day judging and you know taking ballots, which I just love that about her. So that's our story. And that's one of the Minnesota's claims to fame. Um, 
which I think is kind of fun if you didn't know about that already. Okay, after 1920, as I mentioned, women don't stop. No one stops really. They keep shaping the political landscape. They channel energy into teaching about voting, into making sure that we all have our civics lessons. And of course, many women, especially into the 50s and 60s, begin focusing on basic civil rights, fair housing, jobs, education, and of course, voting rights. And we think of the 1965 Voting Rights Bill as a major landmark at this time. Anna Arnold Hedgeman, and she's the last woman I wanna introduce to you today. She was born in Anoka and she was the first black student to graduate from Hamlin University in 1922, 1922. And she went on then, she, she was trained as a teacher and she did teach teach for a while, but eventually she, she moved to Mississippi and moved into social work and worked with the YMCA and became an activist. And long story short, she was the only woman on the planning committee for the 1963 March on Washington. And we don't hear about her. We don't really hear about women on that committee at all, but there she was. And if you, if you Google her, you will quickly find photos of her at the planning table for that march. I didn't include them here because I, I didn't get clearance. I didn't get um, the proper approval to share those photos, to use them in this presentation. I just didn't. We have them for on our website, but I didn't want to put them here. Anyway, you'll find them. And it's really neat to see a woman at that table. She also, I love this about her too. She said after Dr. King delivered his I have a dream speech, she said, I wish I would have asked him to say instead, we have a dream. I love that. And here's a quote from her book that she wrote just after the march. We will not rest until there is justice in our beloved country. And we know that as justice comes to all Americans, it will come in increasing measure to the rest of the world. Love that. So I'm gonna just tell you about, well, why don't we pause for questions actually? Let's go back to Anna and see if we have any more questions. Feel free to put questions in the chat. I don't see any right now, but um, there'll be time at the end as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna keep going then and tell you about some resources that you might wanna explore. I mentioned to you about this book by Professor William Green on the right about Nellie Francis, fighting for racial justice and women's equality in Minnesota. There is much to her story beyond what I told you about tonight. There is much to her husband's story that I didn't mention at all. So I'd encourage you to learn about both of them. And then, um, a shameless plug for a book just published by the MNHS Press, Turnout by Joan Anderson Grow, our longtime Secretary of State. It's a great read as well. She talks a lot about what it was like as a woman coming up in politics in the 1950s and 60s and how she worked with um, women in what was called the Housewives Campaign when she first ran for office. And it was used as a derogatory term, of course, but she saw it as a badge of honor and she won. And it's just a great, great story. Uh, Lori Sturdivant wrote it with her. And if you're familiar with Lori Sturdivant's writing for the Star Tribune for years and other publications, you'll know that it's a, it's a very good book. And there are other books out there too on, on several of the women I mentioned tonight. There's a new book out about um, Marie Batno Baldwin too. And finally, here's something that I think I couldn't recommend more highly. Robin mentioned the Persistence Online Exhibit from Ramsey County. If you haven't checked out this website, please do. And Robin, um, we can share these later too, I think. 
Um, but this is a wonderful online exhibit. Like the Historical Society, there was a plan for, for it to be a physical exhibit, but it's beautifully done and also focuses on individual women. So you learn a lot of the bios of particular women from Ramsey County. And then we did the same thing at MHS. Our Votes for Women exhibit is also online. And if you go to our main website at mmhs.org, you'll see a link for Votes for Women. And I'd encourage you to look at both of these. There are many more women um, promoted on each site. There are many resources, further resources. I didn't share with you tonight a lot of the primary resources that we found, the, the letters, the documents, the photos. You'll see those on our website and you can also get to them. There are also many, of course, on the Ramsey County site through that exhibit too. So I'd encourage you to spend some time with both of those. I might just stop sharing, Robin, so I can see everybody. Okay, there. great. I'm back. Thank Lori's you. here. Lori Sturdivant, you heard Lori me give a plug here. for your book just now. And um, I want to let everybody know that Lori and Joan Anderson Grow will be doing a History Revealed talk for us on December 3rd in partnership with the Eastside Freedom Library. So um, that will be coming up and you can register for that on our website. And I'm going to quickly share, thank you, Kate, for mentioning this, our page um, for our exhibition. And um, we'll put that, I'll copy that and put that in the chat so you can link to that. But feel free to go and explore that as well as the Minnesota Historical Society exhibition. So I want to go back. Um, there were a couple more questions. And let me see if I can scroll down. Um, Joanne asked, when did women who were black get the right to vote? Women who were black did get the right to vote on paper in 1920. And from talking with Dr. Green and others, it sounds very much like there were few barriers in Minnesota and in the surrounding northern states that kept African-American women from voting. What we hear of those poll taxes and the various things that happened, uh, Professor Green is, and others have are fairly certain that that was largely in southern states. So 1920 for women, for Black women, including Nellie and her colleagues in the Every Woman's Suffrage Club, which she founded in 1914. Okay, do we have any other questions? We can put them in the chat. Otherwise, when we stop recording, please feel free to stick around and we can all talk a little bit on things maybe you don't want to put in the chat or ask some other questions or what have you. But while we're waiting, I want to say a big thank you to Kate Roberts for stepping in for Michelle Witte, who could not be here tonight. And please check out the MNHS exhibition as well. It's, it's, it's a great website. It's a fun, fun show. And we, both of our groups, came at suffrage from a slightly different angle. So it's really fun to look at both of the exhibitions. So again, check out rchs.com for upcoming programs. And oh, we do have another question, great. Kathy says, the leaders you talked about as club women, do we know much about less affluent women suffragists? That is a great question, Kathy. And if, if, um, if anyone's looking for a, a research topic, we know some things. We know that there are many, many suffrage groups in towns around the state. We know that there are rural women's suffrage groups. We know that, that there, are thing, there are groups, for example, the Women Workers Suffrage Club, which people founded specifically, obviously, for working women. And there are other groups like that that are made up and reaching out for, um, for to look for people who are, who are working 
who do not have the, the means to, to volunteer for this in great numbers. And okay, so I'm sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. We know something about less affluent women. We don't know nearly enough. And the way we find out those stories, I think, is largely through a lot of newspaper research, because again, these are not the women who wrote the history. But if you spend time in the newspapers, you can start piecing together who's showing up at meetings, whose names appear over and over again, and then you can start tracking them and figure out where they are and what they're doing. There's a really interesting early suffragist up in Duluth named Savory Aiken. And she worked specifically, I mean, she was a, she was a labor activist. She was a journalist and she founded a newspaper, self-published. And as part of that work also was working towards suffrage with working women up in Duluth. So we know these isolated stories but we don't have as full a profile as we'd like. And that's not just in Minnesota, that's a national issue. The other thing that I always wonder about is what's the relationship between church women and suffrage? You know, we have all these church clubs and all of these women gathering to do work through their churches and is suffrage happening there? So we have a lot more research to do, Kathy. And, um, I, for one, would be really interested in the, uh, the stories of rural women and how they were coming together around suffrage. Lori has a question. Kate, so why do you think it took 50 years for women to begin to run for elective office in significant numbers? Lori, you tell me. I don't know. I, I really don't know. We have this, in 1922, we have the four women legislators who um, are elected, run and are elected the first time that they can be. These are, these are Minnesota legislators. One only serves out one term. One, you know, and then it goes from there. One of them stays in office for 20 years till 1944. And then there's a big drop off. And I don't know, Lori, if you can unmike yourself, I would like to hear your thoughts on this, honestly. Well, hi, Kate, good to, good to see you and thank you for an interesting program here today. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, well, you know, I, I think it has to do with the larger uh, things going on in society. It took the second wave of the women's movement to open up occupations of all kinds for women. And it, this, I think running for office is, in, is seen by women in Minnesota as uh, another of the occupations that had been closed to them that was then in the 1970s beginning to open up rather than being seen as an extension of suffrage. Hmm. Uh, it, it's unfortunate that that spirit of 1920 and 1922 when significant numbers of suffragists did see running for office as an extension of obtaining the right to vote, that spirit died out. With the exception, our Von Fraser would always have said, in, in the few places where there were strong League of Women Voters chapters, <laughs> where there were strong chapters, she always said, that's where occasionally you'd see a woman pop up in uh, either local or state government. But it was, yeah. it was sparse. It was very yeah. sparse. Michelle has a really interesting chart that she shows as part of her presentation that shows 1922, then a dip down to nothing. And then, as you say, then in the late 60s and the early 70s coming right. back up. Hey. Okay. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. So again, Lori will be back on December 3rd with Joan Anderson Grove. We're really looking forward to that. I have the book and it's fantastic. Thank you. So um, um, Eileen had a question that I can answer. She wanted to thank us and Dr. Kate Roberts for the presentation. And it will be available online, assuming that the Zoom recording worked. And I'm going to try to get it up <laughs> as soon as it's ready. So that will be on our RCHS YouTube channel, either tomorrow or Monday, all fingers crossed. So um, watch for that. And we'll make that link um, available. Hopefully in next, I'll have to make a note and remember to put it in next week's member newsletter and on Facebook. 
So Michelle had another question um, going back to um, the comments that you and Lori had. Do you know if it was similar around the country? No women running for office like that big dip that you mentioned. I believe so. Lori, can you? Well, I guess I think that is true. With the, there are a few exceptions. Um, there were uh, there was uh, uh, there were a few exceptions in New England states, but it was again it was rare that uh, this running for office was seen as a, an occupation that was somehow close to women, and mm -hmm. uh, it, I think it, as things began to open up in lots of fields in the 1970s, so the notion that we that women could join in running for office became a, a thing again, as it had been briefly after 1920. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a theme that comes across in your book. And I know you'll talk about this more in December with, with Joan Grow, but what it meant for her to be running, you know, yeah. and as I say, the sort of disparaging remarks about this housewife running. Well, and, and she uh, really ran almost by accident. They were actually hoping the women in that area that the League of Women Voters chapter president would be the candidate. And she sought Republican endorsement and was not successful. And Joan was willing to run for DFL endorsement because there were no DFL candidates in that district. And so within 20 minutes, the convention gave her the endorsement. Uh, she actually used the Republican candidate's speech on recipe cards with re the word Republican scratched out and the word DFL then put printed in. So it was you know, really a, a, a spontaneous and sort of accidental thing, but it made Joan one of the six women who were elected in 72 to the Minnesota House. And that was the, the most since there had been four in 1922, mm -hmm. 50 years earlier. It was that long before, and then there was a long dry spell when there were no women in the legislature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Michelle had another comment. Um, she mentions that you wonder if Susan B. Anthony would have run if she'd still been around, so. I bet, I bet, I bet she would have. You know, and I, that's one of the fascinating things about this topic, honestly. You start meeting these women and, and you learn their stories and you just, you realize what a force they would have been and how life would have been different had they been involved in politics. You know, the, the way they articulate their causes and the way that they are able to kind of work together, just, you know, various things that I feel inspired by. And it would be fascinating to do a, to do a little rerun and to see what it might've been like had women been in office earlier. Thank you, Kate, I'm gonna go. Okay, see you, Lori. Okay, I think that's it for questions. Um, again, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I've, oh, there might be one more. Let me see if I can get to that in a minute. Um, what we will do is we'll stop recording and um, I'll let everybody turn on your mics if you'd like to chat a little bit more or have some more questions. I know that some people would like to leave us to go watch the debate. Um, and again, don't forget to vote. And again, thank you. Dr. Kate Roberts, and I'm going to turn off recording. Please join us for another History Revealed soon and um, visit our exhibition.